Today for your approval we have a gorgeous example of a 1925 Martin 018K. K of course stands for koa, which is that magical Hawaiian wood. These are small bodied guitars and they were directed right at people in the market looking for something to play Hawaiian music on, which was really big at the time. Seriously, every college boy was wooing his gal by singing, I want to go back to my little grass shack in Kealakakua, Hawaii. The U.S. annexed the Hawaiian Islands in the 1890s, overthrew the monarchy, installed their own government, and that brought the place into the attention of the American people. Um, not so much the subjugation of an autonomous nation, but the tales of a Pacific paradise, you know, because it was very romantic. It spurred interest. So you have these Tin Pan Alley composers working tropical references into popular songs of the day about a place they'd never been. And you also have the arrival of specific instruments and tunings related to what was going on in the Hawaiian music scene. Um, it was sort of like the rush to sign grunge bands in the Pacific Northwest in the 1990s. They'd been fomenting something of their own way off in the distance there. And when it broke, you know, mainstream musical culture, everyone wanted a piece. Out of this comes the first craze for the ukulele and the lap steel guitar played with a slide. I'm sure there's an ethnomusicologist out there who's traced the relationships between Hawaiian slide and Delta bottleneck blues. The progenitor, Joseph Kakuku, gets himself to America in the opening years of the 20th century. He plays up and down the West Coast and he just gets huge. It can't be understated just how big an influence this was. It really changed American popular music. It also changed stringed instrument making. Ukuleles became a huge money maker for companies that were otherwise just sort of hanging on, gave them some life. And that Hawaiian influence also gives rise to some of the first innovative small shop luthiers on the West Coast. Herman Weisenborn, Chris Knutson, I choose to pronounce his name with the K. Martin made a lot of ukuleles, and in 1918 they decided to jump into the lap steel market. Uh, they decided to use koa may be influenced by those West Coast makers. Um, koa can be quite attractive and eye-catching, and they paired it with the fairly austere decoration of their style 18. Koa is an acacia species. It's fast-growing, gets pretty big. At one time, native Hawaiians used it for making dugout canoes. It's also important ecologically in that it has the ability to fix nitrogen in very young volcanic soil. So it moves in quite soon after the lava flows and helps uh, sort of prepare the way for other species. Unfortunately, it's also been harvested a lot and much of it's been cut down to make way for pasture land. I don't think it's technically endangered, but there's definitely protections in place um, for you know public lands, but also on a private tract. Like if you were to cut down an old growth example, a great big tree, there'd be a whole lot of people standing in front of your truck giving you the stink eye. Because it's sort of a cultural touchstone. People value it. And, uh, yeah, much of the tone wood that you see on the market, these are, most of it coming from stump wood. The O18K came in two configurations. You had the plain K, which is just like a regular O18, just made from a different wood. It's not mahogany, it's koa. And then there's the KH, which we'll call that the real deal Hawaiian setup, which is a flat fingerboard has a tall nut, and the frets are flush. They're not raised. So it's a pure slide instrument, like a Weisenborn. Now there are a lot of those which have been converted to standard play over the years. It's not hard. I think usually you just make a new fretboard. This one I'm not so sure about. Is the board is quite flat. I mean, if there's a radius there, it seems smaller than a 16. So, hmm. It's possible that this was refretted and made into a Spanish-style guitar? I don't know. Let's discuss why the guitar is here. The action is high. It's strung with silk and steel right now, which isn't a bad idea. I mean, I think these were ostensibly designed for steel strings, but they don't have the steel reinforcement bar in the necks that later Martins did. And so, I mean, you can get away with playing regular light gauge strings if you tune down between playing sessions, but not a good idea to keep at concert pitch for long stretches of time. 
still, you know, the action right now is uh, getting on towards 9 64ths on the bass side and almost as high on the treble. You really feel it, you know. 8 64ths on the treble is a bit much. And as we might suspect, the neck has taken a pretty serious forward bow. There's excessive relief. Yeah, it's around 21, 22 thousandths, which is, you know, I'd like to see it under 10. So it's twice what it needs to be. Which brings us to bar frets. From a repair standpoint, there is nothing fun about bar frets. The rectangular in cross-section rather than the T-shaped ones we find on modern guitars. Modern being a relative term. Because you, you've got to understand, by the time Martin gave up on using these in 1934, this was archaic technology. Like 18th century stuff. No other big maker was using them. I think it was just the resistance to change anything that might be perceived as part of their formula for success, you know. They were very conservative that way. But I guarantee there was a big happy sigh of relief in the fretting department in 1934 when that change was made. These things are cantankerous. They have no barbs on the tang like modern wire, so keeping them in place relies entirely on getting the fit just right in their slots. The other thing they do is control the shape of the neck via compression. They act as the truss rod. Um, this is something we play around with in sort of a limited way using T frets, but it's absolutely essential when dealing with bar frets. Because if you hammer in a whole board's worth of these that are just slightly too tight for their slots, that incrementally adds up to the point where you can back bow a neck to the point where it becomes unplayable. Someone has replaced a couple over the years, which we will try and re-replace. These seem to be much thinner in cross-section than the other ones. And they're very dark in color. Um, I'm not sure they're even nickel silver. Like whether that's oxidized, it could even be like jeweler's silver. Hmm. There's also a high fret up here which is producing the same note on adjacent positions, which isn't uncommon with these. The owner of this guitar does some repair himself, but he didn't feel confident working on this one. He suggested maybe a heat press might be in order, and initially that's a great idea. It's kind of attractive, but the mechanics of heating and bending the neck back that much, I just fear, you know, we might loosen a bunch of these frets in the center of the board, you know, depending on how they currently fit the slots. So I'm kind of wary about doing that. Here is some modern T-shaped fret wire. It's got a rounded crown on the top and a tang below that, which is narrower than the crown, into which are pressed these triangular barbs on either side, which uh, help lock the fret into the fretboard. And here's some bar fret wire, which the owner ordered from TJ Thompson. I've mentioned TJ a number of times, I think, in the past few years. Um, He's the guy you go to after you've purchased one of those $100,000 pre-war dreadnoughts at auction because he's been inside more of them than anyone else in the world and his ability to hide his repair tracks is kind of supernatural. The bar frets were dead. Nobody was making them and TJ took it upon himself to have that material manufactured so he could be, you know, 100% accurate in his work and uh, he's very graciously made that available to others in the repair community. You know, for a while there, you could still contact Martin, and they would send you remnants of wire that had been hanging on the wall in their old shop, left over from the 20s, you know, old stock. That material is kind of hard to describe. It's, uh, it's incredibly soft. They'd actually coil it around their hand like an extension cord, something, and, and pop it into the box, and it was all bent and twisted, and it had, like, the consistency was like copper wire or plumber's solder. You know, it was really soft had a fairly high nickel content in there, so that made it tough, but it was like linguine compared to modern fret wire. And it took a lot of work to straighten that stuff out. I wonder if Martin had something like um, a rolling die to do that. Sort of like the, um, the fret bender I use to put a radius on the fret wire. Because it also needs to be resized to work with, and you know the job of straightening it out might have work hardened it to some extent. But if that's what they were using in the old days, those guys in the Martin factory had it rough, man. 
TJ's fret wire comes in a whole range of sizes for repair work, and it's a very different material. You know, it's much more like what I expect to see in a modern fret. So it is time for a neck reset. But, you know, looking at the thickness of the board over the extension on a bar fret job like this, there's not a whole lot of material under there. It gets a little bit scary. Looking at the bridge, the saddle slot is very straight. There doesn't seem to be any angle on it. And I looked pretty closely with breaking light to see whether this had been maybe plugged or something. Looking up close, I don't think this has been plugged. I think this is factory original. This is a straight saddle. This has got an ebony nut, and you can see evidence in front of it of a nut riser. It's obviously been out of the guitar at some point. But yeah, I think we might actually have an 018KH Hawaiian, which has been converted for standard play. There's been some fanciful personalization going on at the headstock. Just used a punch of some kind. You know, just something to differentiate your 018K from all the others at the Luau. You know, don't want to accidentally pick up someone else's. Before getting into the reset, I think it's important to take care of the neck. Its straightness has an effect on the string action, and I want to understand what happens to this thing under tension versus off. So, I said the relief was about 22 thousandths, with strings on and measuring against the top of the frets versus the string. So I think I should also use a notched straight edge and check and see what happens to the board. Um, you know, because if this thing is straight as an arrow under tension, I could just as easily dress some of the excess relief away on the neck jig. Probably not 15 thousandths worth, but enough to make a difference. And, uh, no, we're not so lucky. There is still considerable relief. The board itself is bent, focused somewhere around the 7th fret, which is pretty much where you expect it. Here's another thing. Um, bar frets are often taller than comparable T frets. Where on acoustic guitars, I usually shoot for a fret height between, say, 35 thousandths and 45 thousandths. That's about 0.8 millimeters to maybe 1.15. These things are often 50 thousandths and up. They're quite tall. And that creates a very different feeling to play. Um, there's a noticeable bumping of your fingers against them if you slide around. It's like trying to skateboard over railroad ties or something. So, let's just have a quick look around the board here and see what the fret height is like. And that one's quite low, at around 30 thousandths. And 36 thousandths. That one's around 45 thousandths. Again, 45. So, you know, this are, they're kind of all over the place. Uh, not enough to really dress down too much. Like, if these were super tall, I might just dress them. But because they're kind of average height frets, I don't want to get too aggressive. So we'll see if we can try and bend this neck back using other means. Another thing to measure would be the projected line of the frets where it intersects with the um, front of the bridge and how tall that is off the soundboard. In this case, it's around four and a half, five millimeters. Though that figure might be a little bit skewed by the fact that the last fret here is significantly taller than its neighbors. That one's around 52 thousandths. It's right next to one that's around 35. So now I do all those measurements again without the string tension on. And I see that the amount of relief measured on the fingerboard is uh, about half what it was. This is uh, 11 thousandths now. So the neck is actually coming up 9 or 10 thousandths under string tension. Now measuring at the front of the bridge, the gap is smaller. It's about a 32nd of an inch less than it was. So yeah, it's around 3.75 millimeters now above the soundboard. Yeah, I can confirm that this board is flatter than a standard Martin 16 inch radius. It's probably in the range of maybe 22 inches or so. Although again, it varies from place to place. Yeah, I'm saying 22 inch radius. So does that mean that this was originally flat, and then someone dressed it, maybe pulled the frets and put them in again or something? I don't know. 
That seems like folly. It looks like there was substantial wear in the first position, which has been filled at some point. The dot at the third fret is no longer circular. And the replacement fret wire the owner bought seems to be around 55 thousandths width. And if we're lucky, yeah, these I think are around 53. Maybe even smaller. So what Martin could do at the factory to counteract string tension and get the desired relief would be to use one width of fret wire for the first three or four frets and then go up a size or two adding a thousandth or so for the frets in the area where the relief is usually greatest to push the board outward slightly and counteract that. Um, and that's what we do when we do repairs on bar frets as well. You know, I can hopefully take these frets out in the center and put in a slightly wider wire which uh, will straighten the board somewhat. I'd love to know what this material is. It's tarnished just like old silver. But even in polishing it, it doesn't come up to a bright sort of glossy surface. I think it's almost like steel. There's no way someone would use steel for this. I'll try and clean off some of the accumulated gunk from around it. Once cleaned, relatively speaking, we can see this replacement fret here in the center of the board has what looks like glue in the slot. And uh, it's kind of ragged from where it was pulled out previously. So, you know, I think when we pull this, I'm going to want one of these guys on there just so that we have something to bear against and we're not going to chip up this ancient ebony board. I'm going to put a little water on the uh, sides of the slot here and I'm going to hope that whoever did this previously you know used their head and used like hide glue or fish glue. You can see there's also some damage here on the edge of the fingerboard from a previous removal which we'll try to avoid and uh, Maybe we can fix that up before we're done. It's too thick. Well, just be careful, I guess. Whatever the composition of this metal, it was very hard. It did not behave like normal fret wire. Um, very tight feeling. And there was a whole bunch of glue sort of in and around the slot, which sort of came away, sort of. And that's the sound of me breaking off the corner of my fret removal tool. Very interesting. You can see this fret has sort of an arc filed into its underside here to ensure that it really only contacts on the outside quarter of an inch, um, six millimeters or so, um, to counteract any tendency for the fret to pop up at the end rather than in the center. Here's the condition of the slot. Looks like it might even have some shims at the ends here. This wire appears to be about 52 thousandths in width, give or take a little. And as hoped for, the new material is too wide for the slot. That's good. Yeah, I routed a little groove here, which is slightly shallower than the fret wire. And now I've got to file off about two thousandths of an inch. 
and it won't be the same everywhere along the length. I'm going to have to fit it from there, taking slightly more off in certain areas and less in others. This fitting process went on a lot longer than I'm making it appear. Eventually I got it to the point where I could push it in with some difficulty all along its length. The slot actually leans over slightly, especially on the base side here. There's not a whole lot I can do about that. When I was feeling confident, I broke out the fret pressing jaws and gave it a good squeeze. Hmm. Just forcing in that one fret has made a tremendous difference. The relief has gone from 20 thousandths on the surface of the board down to 10, which is good. Yeah, I know I misspoke in that last shot. I was confusing fret relief with board relief. It actually reduced the relief on the board by a little more than one thousandth of an inch. Then I got to do that whole process over again for a number of other frets. Strangely, it didn't seem to get any easier. That one hadn't been messed with as much. And I want to reinforce the notion that I'm not an expert in bar frets. I don't see enough of them to really get proficient at it. Um, very few shops are, you know, besides TJ. Maybe the guys at Elderly Instruments do enough of these to get sort of conversant with all the ins and outs. But, uh, you know, I know enough to get by. People say, how the heck do you have the patience for something like that? And I don't know, it's hard to explain. I mean, you just have to recognize that it's going to be an exceptionally long, annoying process with no shortcuts going back and forth until it's right, you know. And if you can summon that up within yourself, then there's no problem. You just spend three hours doing something annoying. I guess I'm doing the full first seven frets here, because it doesn't really make sense to leave this one and this one. These two were worn with deep grooves. These ones I needed for the compression. This one's sort of sitting here. It's a little low. And this guy has a little bit of damage as well, but, you know, might as well level them all at the same time. And So I'm going to take out these two as well. Okay, I'm pretty happy with the way these all went in, except that first one, which uh, was the one that had been previously replaced. Um, it's leaning a little bit. I think they tried to reshape the slot slightly. It's wider than the others, and uh, the end is maybe a little bit too wide. So I'm going to put some glue in this one. I'm going to use fish glue, because it's... Uh, easily reversible with heat and moisture, and I'm going to thin it slightly with some water. There's also a couple of areas in the center here which really didn't quite, like they're voids. So I'm just going to allow this to wick in. on the edge with the voids. So I do want it locked in place. And before I take the neck off this thing, I want to do some preliminary leveling. These are all tall and they're all kind of wonky in terms of height. Um, probably averaging around 52 to 55 thousandths. I'm going to bring them down to under 50. Um, this is important so that I have kind of a reference when I'm um, resetting the neck so I know where the line of the frets is going to end up relative to the top of the bridge. So I do want to take a little bit of time here. It doesn't have to be super precise right now. When I posted a picture earlier on Instagram, Hayes Guitars, he, he put the best comment up. He said, happy leveling. He knows. This takes a long time. Then I loosen the fingerboard extension in my usual way. Before 
I put the neck removal jig on this thing, I want to check and make sure that there are a number of these little cracks here and there along the grain, which are seemingly pretty old, and I think they have all been glued up when I looked inside this thing. Here's a quick peek. Fairly stout braces for a 1920s Martin, and less aggressive in the scalloping. You know, I'm feeling glue dribbles along each of them. They don't have cleats, but I do want to make sure that they're at least, you know, reasonably shored up. Because um, there is a certain amount of pressure that comes with the jig in this area, right? Next thing to ponder is, do I really want to remove this 13th fret to gain access to the uh, end of the dovetail and drill my holes through the fret slot like I normally would? Or do I drill, in this case we've got a nice black ebony board, it's not that difficult to hide drill holes in the ebony. I can make that disappear pretty well. Uh, not just because, you know, I spent three and a half hours earlier today putting in uh, seven frets, you know, not just the time consuming thing. The, um, the weight of all these frets on this fretboard extension, which has such a thin sliver of wood holding it all together, it gets kind of con it's it's considerable weight. Uh, you know, I'd hate to take this out, find out that it's very weak in there, and then have it fall apart on me. Because how do you glue that back together? I can think of ways, but none of them are very pleasant. So I think I'm going to drill alongside the fret rather than pull it out. The thing is, the holes that I'm going to drill are actually slightly larger in diameter than the fret slot itself anyway, so I'm not really going to gain anything. I'm just going to drill the holes beside it. Good decision. As it turns out, that's exactly where the gap at the end of the dovetail was. Foam cutters from Hotwire Foam Factory doing their thing. I do this dry, without adding water, and it works just fine for anything less than epoxy. And on Martin guitars or similar precisely made instruments, it's fast. See, it's about 10 minutes, and I get the feeling it's probably time to check, so I'll give it an exploratory wiggle. That seems so. I'll turn those off. I've learned that it's best to use pliers on the heating element itself uh, to pull it out, rather than just trying to tug them out by the handles, because sometimes that melted glue can make it difficult and possibly expensive. Gently clean off as much of the glue as I can. It's it's super loose. Remember what I said about the delicacy of these things? I'm using a file to clean off more glue on the sides of the dovetail. You can see there's a, an original shim there that Martin put in. I'll keep that in place because odds are if it was required the first time, it'll probably be necessary again. Do the same with the top of the guitar under the fingerboard extension. There's a penciled tracking number on the side of the mortise. Then it's on to sandpaper pulls to change the angle of the neck. This again is one of those procedures that is longer than it looks in the videos. There's a lot of checking and rechecking to make sure the angle is, you know, moving precisely and that you're not tipping the neck to one side or the other. You want to keep the strokes um, equal on both sides, but even that, sometimes you favor one over the other, so you might have to do a few extras just to keep things in line. Finally, we see I've got just a little tiny hair's line worth of clearance over top of the bridge, which is where I want it to be. Changing the angle by removing material from the end of the heel loosens the dovetail in its mortise. So I've glued on a mahogany shim on either side here, which, uh, of course, then makes the dovetail too tight. So I have to carefully remove material from those shims until the intersection of the heel and the fingerboard is flush with the edge of the body, and hopefully the heel fits 
snug against the body too. I do this by sanding, scraping, or filing small amounts off those shims. You have to sneak up on it, you know, because you don't want to overshoot. It's really important that the end of the dovetail fits especially well. If it's loose down here, then the heel can eventually come free, ruining the work I did to improve the angle. So it's got to be snug down at the end. The top of the heel is, it's naturally pulled tight against the body by string tension. Um, it should still fit well, but it's not as critical as the end of the heel. See how it's rocking? The dovetail isn't seated completely into its slot yet, um, but there's movement, so that usually means that there's going to be some binding up here on the top side of the tail. Now there's considerably less rocking. It's tight, but still proud by about uh, 3 30 seconds of an inch. So the dovetail is essentially the right shape, it just needs to be slightly thinner. Here's another aid to see what's going on. This is some carbon transfer paper, which I've draped into the slot there. That's going to transfer the point at which the pressure increases um, from the mortise to the cheeks of the dovetail. You can see some dark spots at the top and towards the end. This section in the middle is not as tight. It's not contacting. So I definitely have to remove these black spots and that will increase the um, amount of the dovetail in contact with its slot. Okay. After about 20 minutes of fitting and filing, and fitting and filing, fits good. I've reduced it so the zero point is right in the corner there. And uh, no rocking, good and firm. Requires a bit of pressure to release. You can see I've worked with the original shim from the 1920s, kept the history. Hey, there's some debate about whether it's good practice to put a wedged shim under the fingerboard extension. Some contend that it should just be glued back down flat. I think it depends a lot on the actual neck angle, because if it's high, if you've had to remove a lot of material from the heel, you've got to physically bend that thing down quite a lot. And in this case, there's not a whole lot to bend. It can look funny, too, to have a, a whole lot of fall away. Um, and it can cause odd humps and bumps at the heel to body joint. In this case, I want to keep the board straight and not bend it more than I have to. So I'll put a straight edge on here and kind of measure the gap at the end and make a tapered shim. In Martin guitars, a certain amount of fall away or downward slope in this part of the fingerboard is part of the design. You know, they don't really anticipate you playing on those upper frets, especially on a 12 fret model like this. You're never going to reach them. So I try to factor in at least 20 to 30 thousandths fall away. Uh, it's about 0.5 to maybe 0.7 millimeters. Sometimes it depends on the state of the frets and if I'm doing a full refret or not. Uh, if there's not a whole lot of material that can be dressed off, I want more fall away just for insurance. The other thing I want to do before I glue this up is to check the run of the strings. So I'm stretching a piece of dental floss between the nut slots and the uh, position where the strings cross the saddle and seeing how that lines up with the edge of the fingerboard. I want to see a fairly even margin on both sides. It looks okay. Gems is really annoying to me for some reason. It's one of the parts of the process that I don't look forward to. But anyway, I plane it, I scrape it, and I sand it. And this one tapers from about a millimeter to zero. Then I'll glue it to the underside of the extension. I have to trim the edges. This is still so floppy. That's why I used a single wedge this time rather than gluing the neck on first and wedging it afterwards like I often do these days. I want to stiffen it up and hopefully keep it straight. Oh, and you may see a fly buzzing in and out of shot. This is the day.
My house is 130 years old, and it's got a stone foundation, and one day, every summer, a horde of house flies appears. It's disturbing because I associate it with the presence of pure evil. Filling the heater holes using some ebony dust. And then a drop of CA glue, which will be repeated over and over until it's full. Some light sanding. And it's like it never happened. Time for the glue up. I've got special blocks on the inside to um, allow the clamps to have something to hold on to that isn't the top of the guitar or the brace. Clean off the glue. I'm going to need a taller saddle. This one is likely glued in, hence the little grooves that have been filed into it to lower the strings. These can be difficult to get out. I'm going to dribble some cold water along either side of the slot uh, and let it sit there for 20 minutes or so to soak in and hopefully soften the glue. Do you pronounce it pipette or pipette? Put my bridge heater on there to warm things up. And it's still kind of a struggle. You can see how little of this saddle was actually exposed above the bridge. I want the bottom of the slot to be as flat as possible. The new saddle blank has to be fit really snugly. I don't want any rocking. This side's good, this side still needs uh, a little bit to come off. This saddle blank is obviously much too tall, so I'm going to mark where it inserts into the bridge and then cut some off and uh, put a radius on the top of it. So I've got to put something like a 24 inch radius on this thing. Um, the biggest radius I have here in my gauge is a 20, so I'll start with that and just basically eyeball it. Everything takes longer with bar frets. That frets a rockin', so I'm a come a knockin'. Trying to dress the frets on one of these without some kind of neck jig seems like a real folly to me, because they seem to take on way more back bow than a comparable modern neck. Um, this was showing like 10, 12 thousands worth of back bow clearance at the first fret, and with strings on it pulls up to like four or five thousandths worth of relief, which is really nice. But how would you dress that? You would be forever going back and forth trying to make it work. Fret crowning takes longer on bar frets. Careful filing is needed to get the ends under control while not messing up the surface of the neck. I filled that little area that was all torn out by the seventh fret. I put a dab of shellac over things to seal them up and make it look pretty. I need to create a smooth radius on the ends of the saddle, so I just use a dowel with some sandpaper. This nut has seen better days. I'm not even sure if it's original, but several slots are too low. One of them's already been shimmed up. Still too low, so I think I should make a new one. It's pretty odd and crudely shaped. Filing the slots, taking off the excess, I'm going to shape and sand it. Looks pretty nice. With these through saddles, you have to do a lot of work on them from the top rather than sanding their bottoms like you would on a, a more modern bridge. Those filing, scraping, I didn't have a heart to show you the polishing. You know, I've been doing all the setup work taking care of a couple of unlevel frets near the body joint. Doing all that with a set of these Ernie Ball silk and steels on it. This is actually a bronze alloy wrap. I don't like what I'm hearing. I'm not a huge fan of silk and steel sound in general, but in this case it feels like they're not giving this thing enough energy. It's very quiet and muffled and it's like I'm playing it here but the music is being filtered through a wall or something. Um, it's unlike the other Koa guitars I've played, too. It feels like it needs something with more octane to really drive the top. These were ostensibly among the first 
guitars that Martin designed specifically for use with steel strings. And looking at what's happening to the body and hearing what's going on, I think, yeah. I think it will probably perform better with regular extra light steel strings. So I'm going to switch these out. That might not be the case for every one of these guitars though. You know, your mileage might vary. Just sometimes you get a super stiff top and some really resilient braces and uh, you need something that'll drive air, you know. Uh, otherwise it's like trying to play a semi-hollow electric without plugging it in. Then on the other hand, sometimes you get a really weak top and really floppy braces and you're forced to use nylon strings, otherwise it's going to self-destruct. So this is freshly strung, different strings, much better sound. Got lots of brake angle on the saddle. Uh, but experience tells me that this is likely to change shape over the next week or so. It's going to kind of come into its own and I will probably have to come back and shave about a 32nd of an inch off the saddle after it's settled a bit. Um, that's still going to leave us with a saddle height of about 3 30 seconds of an inch, which I think is probably about optimal. I know some of you will ask about the intonation with this non-slanted saddle. Surprisingly good. E's right on, B's a little bit sharp, everything else is within 2 or 3 cents. And not noticeable. Maybe the bridge itself is actually glued on at a slight slant to the center line. It's not noticeable if it is, but it's doing well for itself. Let's play this thing. Mm -hmm. 